a lot of people always ask me, what are you most afraid of or what's most likely to happen at a service call? Am I going to destroy somebody's piano? Am I going to like make it catch on fire? Or am I going to make it explode if I tune it wrong? No, 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 no. The, the, the actual thing that will happen on a fairly regular basis, if you're not careful, and it just it seems to happen out of nowhere, is case damage. And so the reality is that is the thing that more often than not seems to happen. And to have a touch-up expert come in can be two to $500. So literally one, one ding can be three tunings worth of, of, of damage. So it's a big, big, big deal. And I would say that 95% of it, 90% of it is completely avoidable absolutely avoidable and usually what happens with technicians and we've had apprentices as well as seasoned technicians have the same issue is that they will just be getting ahead of themselves and so they'll be like okay this piano hasn't been worked on in a while okay i think i'm seeing this i'm just i'm just playing it I, i'm seeing all these things and they get distracted from the very essential basic thing of disassembling the piano this happens all the time. And that's why we actually have relationships with uh, touch-up artists, because this seems to happen a lot. It's very rare that we actually drop something. It's more that, it, it, what I mean by that is like a tool or a tuning hammer. Now that can happen, but usually it's us hitting the piano or hitting a wall that happens too with a case part. Stacey, I don't know. You're shaking your head like, yes, this is this is a thing. And I don't know why it's a thing. It just it's is. It is absolutely a thing. And it's uh, or or taking out the fall board and scratching the sides of the piano. Yes. Oh, that one, that one. Oh, and, and it does. It does cost you. <laughs> it so. costs a lot of money. Ooh. And they you will find that there's a lot of leniency and people like relaxed, but when it comes to you scratching their piano, it feels like it is out the, out the door. People are fairly upset when this happens because they are like, it was fine. Now it's not, are you going to charge me? So let's just kind of set the stage of assuming this does happen. One, we do not charge the tuning. That's what we've just done as a policy. It's like, we have damaged something. We have made something worse. I'm not going to have any of our technicians be like, yeah, and by the way, I know I'm going to have somebody come out here and fix this. It's 195. Nope. That just became a free tuning. And we're going to have the uh, have a touch-up expert come in and fix this. So it's, it's a big deal and it can be avoided. And that's, I guess that's all I'm trying to kind of relate to you. Get a little bit of fear in you. you just so that you know that this can be a big issue and it's, it's very much avoidable in, and I have kind of a series of things that I always do in this, but questions about this so far. Um, this is the best topic ever <laughs> because this is like real life. And it's really important for you guys to know a, a, a refinisher because if it does happen, the number one thing to do is to communicate with the customer and also assure them. Well, first you have to have a refinisher that you know can do a good job. But if you have that confidence in your refinisher, mm -hmm. then you can say, I promise you, they'll be able to fix this. No problem. They work for moving companies all the time. And, you know, like if you're able to just, the, the reason they get upset is they don't think you can fix it. And that, I, you know what I mean? That's, so you have, and you can't yep. over promise either. Like you have to be, oh, yeah. it's a tricky one. And I would also say, and I've done this, I've done both ways where I've convinced myself, no, that I probably didn't scratch it right there. That scratch was probably already there. Don't do it. Just if you, if you notice a scratch, if there's any possibility that you did it, just be, just be up front. It's like, Hey, Mrs. Smith, I just, you know, when I was taking the case part, I did notice this little that I might've bumped it right here. Is this, has this always been here? usually they'll see the distress in your voice and just see, and they'll be like, oh, no, it wasn't there, but that's totally fine. Thank you for showing me. 
I've also done the opposite where I've assumed it was there. I didn't say anything. And we get the call a day later, like your technician scratched my piano. So address it head on. You're always going to be ahead to do that. So the first thing to do when you're breaking down a piano is first just clear your mind. Literally, that's the easiest thing to do. And yet also the hardest, but the, the easiest thing to do to avoid you damaging anything would just be like, okay, take a step back. You're excited. You're with the first time with this customer, or this is a repeat customer. You're excited to work on their piano. Get it. So take a deep breath and just be like, okay, my job right now is just to safely remove all the case parts. And I'm going to know where I'm going to put them. What is my number one do or my number one don't? For when you're putting your case parts somewhere can anybody tell me don't put don't them against, against the wall, wall. <laughs> don't lean them up against the wall who said that yes like three of us <laughs> and i did it the other day i did it i did it the other day and i and i went and i put it up against the wall and i thought just for a moment i'm like nope 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 because it was the only convenient space it was like right here and I was like, nope, I'm not going to do it. So I had to even catch myself because I'm like, why am I doing this? And it only takes a quick bump and it is just gone. And it dents the floor. Oh, we've had that happen too, where it actually dents the floor, which is a whole nother thing. So first things first is I am just clearing my mind, looking at my environment. I will go ahead on an upright piano because nine out of 10 times, you need to go ahead and put your lid prop here. Go ahead and just get into the uh, to the uh, habit of doing this. Whoa. I don't like that I have this little thing right here. Just because a lot of times I've leaned that flap against the wall and I thought that it was fine. And then I get done with the tuning and I'm like, wait a second. I've rubbed a little dent in the drywall behind it. You, you all, you, I, I have literally made every mistake for you all. This is just, <laughs> just don't do it. So make sure to go ahead and always put your, your lid prop. I've done this thing where I've kind of assumed it was going to be okay, but even right here, you can tell it's going to touch that and wear it. By the time I'm done jiggling the piano, tuning it, it might've already made a little indentation. So get your lid prop, get used to putting that on there every time. When you're, I always, 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 for whatever reason, start with the top board. And I just demonstrated what you don't do. Just this willy nilly, oh yeah. And I've seen technicians do that. That's a very common thing. We just kind of, I don't know what it is, but just get used to one hand on each side. Remove it, remove the tabs. You're good, you're slowly walking because most of the time, we're hurting something in this, in this zone right here. <laughs> we're looking for that space to put it. In this case, I've already figured out this is the spot against this wall, like on the ground is where I'm gonna put it. There's no traffic. I know that this, it's not gonna get hit. I'm just gonna put it down right there. Again, that's the first one I always do is that top board and it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the case parts. I'm a little bit different than most in that I actually like to have the majority of all the case parts removed because I find that I want to do more of a service when I'm at a, at a tuning service. And so I want to be able to have access to everything. So I think a lot of technicians will go ahead and leave this on the fall board and they'll leave the bottom board off. Not me. I'm going to go ahead and right away remove the bottom board as well as the fall board, even if it's not inhibiting anything. Because I want to quickly, efficiently be able to make any repairs on site. This is one that you will run into fairly frequently, especially on modern pianos. It's these fall boards with these metal tabs right here. Now, these are fine. They seem to work okay, but they can scratch up the sides of the piano like nothing else. So be very careful when you're removing them 
and putting them in not to mar up the sides of the case because that just happens a lot. And that is one where the customer will look at it and just be like, hey, this was not here before. I need you to fix that. Another thing that I'm always removing is the key up stop rail. Again, it's another situation where I want to have freedom to do any little thing if, as needed. So if I'm noticing sticking keys, it just makes, or it, it, having everything disassembled means I'm more likely to check everything that much quick, quicker and easier and do a better, more complete service. Because again, half the job's done for me. So this piano, I've gone ahead and removed just about everything from it. I've even done it where I've removed the key slip just to make sure that I have everything just fully available so that I can make sure that there's no sticking keys. So this is another option, especially if it's only got one or two screws, if it's easy to do, I'll go ahead and do that. And so everything is off to the side. It's, it's, it's not gonna get hit by any kids, any animals. Usually I'll lean them up against the wall like so. Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it, but um, usually I'll kind of lean it like that. And, and usually I'm good to go. And so everything has been removed. And from here, I can go ahead and um, if I wanted to go and clean underneath the keys, I can do that by removing the action. But this is a good starting point to be like, okay, I'm here. And now I'm going to go ahead and just do a full evaluation. Because what I like to do at every appointment is a complete evaluation. How are there any red flags? Is there any issues? Does the soundboard have cracks? Does the bridges have cracks? Everything is exposed and I can do that as well as do my cleaning. Since I'm already doing down here, cleaning things out, this is also the time where I, where I will go ahead and adjust and regulate my pedals. Usually it's a simple, you know, pretty quick and easy thing to do is just to quickly adjust them. And then again, since I'm already here, I'll go ahead and lubricate the pedal rods. I have one pulled out just so you can see. And usually I'll dab a little bit of that what do we call it, Stacy? Tuba lube? Or I can't remember what we called it. Basically, yeah, no, no, I can't remember. I'll, I'll get it. It's like, <laughs> lube right here. No, I can't and remember. again, it's sold on Amazon. So um, a little bit of dab right there and a little dab right at the bottom side. And it's just something quick and easy that will that actually makes a big difference because a lot of time where this, this bar goes up to the action there's a little rubber spacer and that rubber spacer when it's touched with this just right can make kind of a squeak sound and by lubricating just that right there it, it most of the time that'll take care of it super so again this is lube. i'm i'm in the piano maybe five minutes at this point thank you super lube can you use this and so okay. um, but this is the time to do that to check all the pedal marks. So say it again, Robert. No, I just had uh, Stacy gave me a thumbs up. This Protect Lube can uh, is that yes. similar? You can use that as well on the pedal rods, right? You can, but the reason I like the grease, the grease, it, it, it's it's a different kind of glue. It's more of a gelatin almost, and it just it's not as watery and loose, and so it just kind of stays on the on the part where you want it to to stay. But again, usually I'm here five minutes. I've broken everything down. I've removed everything. I now have an easy visual to go ahead and start making uh, an assessment of the piano. Uh, and this is a good time if one of the services that you want to offer is actually, you know, cleaning underneath the keys, which is a cool value added if you wanted to do that, you know, and it doesn't take that much time. Again, starting out, guess what? You usually have more time. So this would be an added thing that you can do, whether you're going to charge for it or not. But go, and I have teachers that especially love this. So because a lot of piano teachers that are making little notes and everything with their pencils, and a lot of times that pencil eraser 
material falls off underneath the keys. When I'm removing the action, usually there's three pedal rods. Usually there's some kind of a bass lift. Obviously there's the, the uh, uh, soft pedal right here, the far left. Usually the metals, middle pedal is a bass assist. So before I remove the action, I'll go ahead and just check that that's the case. So again, far left pedal being the soft pedal. In this case, the, the middle pedal is that bass lift. And then of course we have that overall damper lift. So I know that that's where they go. A lot of times what I'll do to make life easier is I'll disengage those pedals from their holes down here, just to make things a little easier. So that when I remove it, it's quick and easy. So David, when you're holding the action, are you holding it on the 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 um, hammer rest rail in the in the side brackets, or are you just holding the the action brackets? Good question. With all my uprights, I'm usually holding it right here, about shoulder length apart, right on that um, damp uh, that hammer rest rail, about shoulder length apart, like this. Here my curls. So, and that's just what I found to be the easiest. I know that some people swear by like, hey, you know, go one on the end and the other on the other end. This feels very awkward and uncomfortable. So that's, that's what, why. I, that's I, what I had been doing, but you know, I'd seen yeah. in some videos where they were grabbing it on the hammer rest rail. Yep. Now, now I'm also a tall guy and I have extra long, long arms, so it's maybe a little easier for me to grab the bracket. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I would just soon, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't experienced any issues with like flexing. That would be the only thing of, of like, wow, I've, I've, there's so much weight and I've flexed that, that um, hammer rest rail. And I've never experienced that in all these years. So I'm not too worried about that. So again, if you're really wanting to wow your customers, <laughs> you getting the piano down to this point, and even to the point where you've removed all the keys and just have everything laid out. It looks like kind of a, I don't know, an Ikea piano. But everything's out like this in a nice orderly, in a nice orderly way. Then you bring your customer in and say, hey, just wanted to let you know that I've kind of looked over everything. So far, everything looks good, and I'm just going to do some cleaning. You can see how this is, you know, kind of dirty. Oh, wow, the last guy didn't do anything like this. Nope, that's no problem. Happy to do it. So again, getting the piano broken down to this stage in an orderly, precise manner allows you to do really good work. It's very impressive to your customers, and not a lot of people are, are willing to take the extra time to do this level. And at the end of the day, I don't know, it's psychological, I know, but it feels like the piano plays and sounds better when you go to this level of, of, of a really complete rounded service. Questions so far? The uh, key upstop rail, I posted a picture of one that I destroyed, but they were trashing it. But I don't know why they make those on some of these uprights with those two rods because the little screw that goes in there was so deep in the well and it was pretty tight. I could not get it out. I thought if I had to service this and put it back, I don't know how I would get it undone. And I was frustrated. So I don't know if there's a tool. I, I could not without just ripping the wood out. A lot of times, so was it slotted, Robert? Was the top of it kind of somewhat slotted, the screw? Uh, I'd have to look. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the speed. Yeah, show that picture. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, so Robert, because what you're, you actually are bringing up a really great point. Can you say that? One of the things that I wanted to, oh, 
Do you see that one? Uh, I'm going to full size it. Maximize. Yeah, it has a slot in the center, <laughs> yeah. David. Exactly. So it is a slot. So a couple things. So what I usually will have is some kind of a, um, a, a fairly narrow flathead screwdriver attachment for my combination tool somewhere. And so what that does is it allows me to get it on one side of that slotted and kind of work it out or down. But to, but to Robert's observation, one of the things that you will notice is usually there's uh, there's a screw that goes on the ends of this rail, this key op stop rail, and then there's usually one to two, like here, middle sections where there's that screw that protrudes. And there's usually a nut that's at the very bottom and then a nut at the top that cinches it down. I can't tell you how many pianos I've come to where there's a weird click right in these breaks where that screw comes up. And a lot of times those keys will be elevated or depressed in a certain way. And what it is, is it's that usually nine out of 10 times, it's that lower nut, that screw that goes up, there's a nut below and that nut has worked its way down to where it's holding down or touching these keys. So that's a major culprit you will find in customers' pianos with, you know, European pianos, excuse me, uh, Asian made pianos, a lot of Yamahas, a lot of Kawais, where they have several of these screws and that nut can work its way down to where it's touching that key, to where it's making a click, or in some cases, holding it down. So be sure to check that and, and make sure that they're adjusted properly. The way that this should be adjusted is there should be a little space from, uh, I should be able, you know, at the rest position, once I get the action back in, I want to be able to lift this key upwards and have the, a little bit of space. There needs to be that lost motion and that space between the, the top of the key and that bottom of that felt with the key up stop rail. And then you'll know it's adjusted properly. If you don't have any space, that's usually going to cause issues of some kind. So that space would be like a sixteenth of an inch, or just yeah. enough that, enough that you have a little bit of play as you lift. Right? Exactly, I would say a sixteenth of an inch is a good. That's that's a good rough and in, in measurement for that. But that happens a lot, and I will follow a lot of technicians where they've had multiple techs, usually not our crew, which I'm glad, glad about. But usually we'll follow other work, and they'll say, "Yeah, there's these two keys." And I'll sure enough come and right away I'll see that, yep, it's right here. And it'll be grand or upright. And it'll be where those screws go up to hold that key up stop rail. And those nuts will have worked their way down and just need to be worked back up. And then the top nut cinched down. Again, using a flathead screwdriver that's a little bit thinner that you can get on one side and crank it down. I'm going to get a glass of water because it's right here. I need water. <laughs> The nice thing about piano servicing is that the reality is most of these repairs that we're talking about are fairly simple, but you need to know what to look for. And so just like Michael had last week, it was a fairly easy repair, but to know what to look for, oh, they're just off the um, front rail. Uh, what was Yeah, it? the front rail Michael pins. Front just... rail pins. Yeah, just off of there. Or these, the nuts that had had just found that winded their way down it's very easy to do but you gotta have the experience and know what to look for and that's kind of what we're trying to do here is give you all the hey this is the thing to look out for don't scratch the piano by doing this these are the if we can save you just a little bit here and there um it'll make your life as a tech a lot easier a lot more fun because when you have these things that come up where you either don't know how to fix it or you've damaged the piano and you didn't need to it makes the job in that moment not very fun. For for those that have, are going into the customers' houses, is this roughly how how far you're breaking it down to, or are you doing more? Are you doing less? What's your what's your protocols? 
for uprights? I did not take off the kickboard if the pedals were working fine and I was just there to tune it. But mm -hmm. if it looked really dusty, I would take it off and do a little cleaning down below. And probably because my tunings yeah. took so long yeah. anyway, yeah, that, would that would just be more time. <laughs> I can yeah. take it off the kickboard because I no, can probably. I, I totally get it. that. <laughs> I totally do that too. <laughs> I had that happen the other day. It was, it was like a spinet. <laughs> it just and it, when it comes, and when it happens, I was just like, ah. Oh. And so, but that time I had not already taken the kickboard off. So yeah, take it off because when you drop those mutes, it'll make it that much easier to retrieve them. <laughs> That's funny. I love the brutal honesty. Thank you, Justin. For me, I haven't really removed the actions other than my practice pianos. Um, partly because the, the older pianos that I've been working on, if I took the action out because they have broken bridle straps, everything would just totally. be a mess. So I, am, I know that I'm not going to remove the action unless they want to get the bridle straps and do a, you know, a, an overhaul of the action. So. Yeah, and I, I and that's a really good point, Michael. Because this is more of a best case scenario. If you can break it down to here, and the piano can be done properly, you know that's great. But you're right. Some of these older pianos, if they have the brass rail flanges, I'm like walking on eggshells. I'm just very careful, very gingerly doing anything that I need to, just to avoid any kind of compromising. It's like working around an atomic bomb. It's like I do not want anything to happen. Because it can be a Pandora's box, especially because it seems like the times that it does happen, it's with a customer that is kind of finicky to begin with. They didn't want to spend a lot of money, and now you've just added to it. I don't know why those two go together more often than not, but it seems to. So, yes, know, know the environment that you're going into, the situation. But with a piano like this that's a little bit newer piano, I feel fairly confident getting it broken down to this point. But to Robert's point... Yeah, if it's taking you two, two and a half, three hours to do the tuning already and things of that nature, you're, you're not going to really have time to do that. So maybe set this as kind of the goal of like, okay, I want to get my tunings down to an hour and a half so that I can have an extra half an hour to do this. Now comes to the point, though, where we're putting the action back. And I would say that this is a point where we have a lot of things can, can go wrong. And so... When you're doing this, the first thing that I will typically do is decide whether I'm going to try to attempt to just put the action in and then put the rods in after or kind of do them in tandem. And so usually if I'm, if I'm adventurous and it's early enough in the morning and I've had my coffee, I'm going to try to do it all in one shot instead of going down underneath the piano and trying to feed them where they go. And so what I'll do is let me see if I can get a better angle here. So bear with me. No, it's not too bad. So the first thing I'm going to do is just make sure that all my pan my the pedal rods are connected. So right now, yes, great. I know that this rod right here coincides with the uh, uh, soft pedal. So it's going to move the hammers closer. Um, it looks like my other two pedals aren't actually, or my pedal rods are not actually on the pedals. So I'm just going to take a guess and just say, okay, um, that looks right. So I've gone ahead and just set the pedal rods where I know they, they go on their coinciding assemblies. So again, the middle pedal in this case is a base damper lift. So I know that that's going to go on that side uh, and to the right side and then my full on damper lift is going to be on that far left side, so I'm all good to go there. So what I'm going to do, again, holding the action is about shoulder length apart. Typically what I do with these is I will just go ahead and set this on the pivot points first. So again, I've not put the rods on, I've just set them on kind of the pivot points that are on one on each side. And that's usually something that's fairly easy to do. 
The next thing I'm going to do, and again, sometimes this is easier said than done, is I'm going to go ahead and just put the rods inside their coinciding holes where they go on their levers. Now, I just went to go do that. And in this case, the base one, totally easy to do. It should be the, the, the overall, a damper lift was easy to do. My uh, soft one is easy to do, but that base <laughs> lift is nearly impossible to get to where I want it to be. So I will have to go ahead and put go down underneath the piano and just kind of feed that where it needs to go. This is a good job if you had one of those um, Cyclops lights. You know, this is this is one of those jobs where that makes uh, a lot of sense. But typically what I'll do in this case is I will go ahead and tighten down the action before I install that base lift rod. So I'm just tightening it down because I don't want anything to get out of place. And I'll just simply come down. I can look fairly easily, see where it needs to go. I usually put it in the action, you know, that, that, uh, that bracket right there, and then I lift it into place, and then we're good to go. So again, usually, even with the more modern pianos, I'm able to get two of the three rods in and one go. And then sometimes that middle rod, I'll have to kind of go underneath the piano and, and do it that way. So, and then I will go ahead and check them just to make sure that I have them in the right order because I've done that before with the two that are inside the piano, the bass, and then the overall dampers. Questions? I know that some of this is kind of like, yeah, that's kind of no-brainer, and makes sense. But this is the stuff where people make some of the most and biggest mistakes, is, is right in the easier stuff. It's actually interesting you talking about the, the, the base um, damper pedal. In it, because on my Samic, it's a practice rail instead. So seeing the difference of the piano that you're working on, having the third rail kind of going into a different part of the action versus the practice rail on mine is just there on the left and it's a hook that goes up to the spring so yeah 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 yeah. i know what you're talking about i see what you're saying and also on that and, on, on the samic it's a little bit different on that center pedal instead of having the levers like you have which is more all three levers are kind of the same with the springs and stuff the samic actually has a, a basically um a wire going up the center that then transfers energy over to the hook. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a little yeah, bit yeah. different. Yeah, and I would say that, hmm, I would say most modern upright pianos, I would say 2000 and onward, most of them do have that practice rail. They usually do have that practice rail where that, that, that felt drifts down, and, and that's that middle pedal feature. Stacy, would you say that that's about right? I think so. I think so. I, I think roughly that 2000 think, era. I think so. I'm trying to think if it's, I don't know the break off, but that sounds right. Yeah. Sounds right. So with the older pianos, you, again, a lot of the older uprights are two pedal. <laughs> you got your bass and you got your, your uh, soft pedal. The unicorda pedal, which I don't even know if that's what we call it in an upright. Now that you I think don't. about it, you yeah. don't. It's just the soft pedal, and so yeah, it's. And, and you will be amazed how many people just ask, "What do the pedals do?" So be very, <laughs> be very, uh, 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 on top of like being able to explain in real terms. Okay, the far right pedal makes the sound. You know, break it down in the simplest terms is it makes the sound sound out. And then it's called the damper pedal. And it dampens the sound when you lift up and off. Okay, that makes sense. The far left pedal, what's that called? In an upright, it's called the soft pedal. And it moves the hammers closer to the strings, which makes it so that they actually travels less, making it quieter. It's the easiest way to say it. 
Well, what about the, the middle pedal? Why is there a middle pedal? And then it goes into the whole discussion. Well, pianos were designed and then you go into the Sostenuno. So it, it kind of decided how yeah. far you want to go. Yeah, because the, the center pedal can actually have three to four different functions depending oh, on the area totally. of the piano. Yeah, and, and, and whether it's an upright or a grand. So, yeah. Some pianos have dummy pedals there too. Like yes. there's, this one, there's this one Yamaha brand. I'm like, they're like, it's broken. I'm like, actually, it's like a, not a real pedal. But, <laughs> and I showed them that there's no no parts. Like it's yeah, just there. The, the upright at my parents has a center pedal. That's not oh, really? anything, and there is nothing there. You know, that's a, a 1924 Hobart cable, and you know, it just has two functioning pedals, and the middle pedal doesn't go to anywhere. The world of piano pedals is an interesting world. <laughs> well, and then you'll get into even complicated stuff because most grand pianos that have a middle pedal, it's not an actual functioning sostenuto. And so then you have to go into the discussion of what is the middle pedal for? Well, it's just called a sausage noodle pedal. Well, what's a sausage noodle pedal? Well, it isolates one of the notes. Well, why isn't this one doing it? Well, because the manufacturer wanted it to just be a bass damper lift. Well, what do I use that for? And you're like, I don't know. It just says use it. <laughs> you know what? I would always, I always hoped that customers just wouldn't bring it up. If they hardly ever did, but when they would, I was like, Okay, I'm like, do you want my like yeah. two minutes? Yeah, you do want the short discussion or the long discussion? Because I found the first few times I tried explaining it when I was new at it, like I feel like I got so confused. I would start to see them like, like get that look, and I'm like, oh, I'm making it worse. I gotta clean this up. <laughs> Just have a PowerPoint ready, just in case. <laughs> I'd usually just be like, hey, whoever, whatever tech, I'm like, would you just explain this? I think I'm just, I'm just not explaining it well. It's not you, it's me, you know? <laughs> it's just... A lot of times I have the customer, they start to feel embarrassed. They're like, well, I don't really use my Sostenuto pedal that often. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. It's true, pedal feels real, like they really... <laughs> Yeah, I was at a customer today. Just It shows how she has a degree in um, vocal performance is what she had. And so it's like really high end degree. And she had to do a lot of piano to get this degree, even though it was her vocal performance. She had no idea what the pedals did. And she had spent a lot of time around a piano. And that's fairly common. And they're usually mortified to just like to say it. Because I even asked them, like, hey, how, do you use the pedals very often? Because this one isn't working quite well. And she's like, no, not really. And then she kind of rustled up enough courage. She's like, I actually don't know what the pedals do. Can you tell me? I'm like, absolutely. But it, it's, it's amazing how much the mystery the piano is to the player. Because I, I'm a good guitar player, and I know the inside and out of a guitar. Granted, it's a lot less sophisticated, a lot easier. But I think that most musicians know more about their their instruments than pianos pianists know about their pianos. I, I'm going off on a limb. I don't know if, if other musicians, if you've felt the same way or not. That, that's You're exactly right. The, I, I heard of the action, but I, I couldn't have named anything else. I mean, I knew what the pedals did as a piano player, but and I knew what the action was and the, and the soundboard. But the only thing that I knew was that, like, if your soundboard's cracked, you know, your piano's done. Well, I didn't realize that that's not the case until I learned a little more. So some of the things that we think we know, we don't really know. So what was the reason, um, and, and this is like no fault, I mean, I'm just curious, what was the reason that you didn't kind of look into your instrument more? Was it like, no, I have the, I have the gist of it. I don't really care to learn more. Or is it like there wasn't enough information or is it just. For me, all of the above. Mm -hmm. And it became my secondary instrument once I started playing bassoon. And so it was just sort of a place I would go to. I never really thought about it because everything pretty much worked. Yeah. And I, I didn't have any technical issues with it. And that could be one thing. I never really had sure. to have it worked on other than tuning. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and again, there's no, 
it's totally fine. I'm just always kind of curious about that because um, it, it is such an industry thing where most pianists just have no idea what to expect, what to think about, how the piano works, what the the piano is capable of doing for them. What's people are just like blown away when I say that we can adjust the tone of the piano. Just had no idea that that was an option, that they can change the tone through voicing and tone regulation. They just thought that, oh yeah, Yamahas are just bright. Uh, Kawais are just this way. Steinways are just this way. And they're usually just blown away when I say, hey, we can change it. Today I changed it for somebody and they just, they had no idea. And so I'm excited that you all are gonna do that for your customers because they will be blown away because I can guarantee you most of the people that have come before you will have never done that. Well, I never really asked the gal that I tuned her piano and you know fixed the keys from the, the piano being moved. I had moved the whole action out, set it on my little portable table and I called her in after I had the keys working. And so she got to see the action outside of the, the piano. And of course she had a, you know, a reaction that, you know, as far as that's, I've never seen that before type of thing, but I didn't never really ask her yeah. more detail about that. But yeah. So when you, when you open stuff up, they're going to get curious. They are. And the only thing I have to warn you all is when you go this to this length, when you're breaking the piano down, um, imagine somebody used this analogy. It was really good. I think it's in the book, maybe selling the invisible. And it was a great analogy. It says, you know, somebody goes to the barber shop and it's the first time there and they just, they put the apron on them or, you know, the thing, they actually buzzed the back of their hair. They actually did a, you know, a little shave and then they did the vacuuming. Okay, great. You have set, they set the tone for that haircut. And then they come in, three months later, whenever it is to do the next one is, and, and they didn't do the vacuum thing. Okay. There's just, okay, well, it wasn't as good. And then the next time they come in, well, maybe they did the vacuum, but they didn't do this thing. You need to know that the consistency is absolutely key. And we struggle with that within our company because we have multiple technicians and trying to layer in every piano gets this. And if it doesn't get that, explain why or why not. Um, so just so you know, as I'm showing you this, and if you want to start implementing it, do make sure to either really communicate to your customer that this is a first time service, or this is that initial thing, or this is what they can expect every time and then live up to it. So we had it so much so that we used to have everybody wear these vests. And that was like such a thing that people like loved. So that when we had somebody who didn't wear the vest, they like didn't come back to us because they loved that vest so much that they were like, no, I, I, they used to do this and now they don't. So just so you know, you're setting that expectation, whether you know it or not. And so just be aware of that. Very well said. Um, and if you do something, it's okay to take notes. Like, you know, if you, you won't always remember if you go do something extra, so take notes. <laughs> So before you go back next year, remember, because that consistency is a thing. It is a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's an absolute thing. And I've had the same thing because I used to go to the steak restaurant. Oh, we lost you right during the steak story. Steak <laughs> restaurant. He had me at steak restaurant. <sighs> no. Oh, I'm so sad. He's going to have to save that story. That might be it. It might be it. Yeah. <laughs>